Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Hemostasis is essential to any surgical effort. Uh, for body, the body's protection, there must be an adequate hemostatic mechanism at work. This mechanism is generally considered in two phases, a vascular phase and a coagulation phase. The blood vessels that have been opened up by the laceration, whether it is accidental or whether it's intended through surgical effort, these blood vessels have to respond by contracting and then within the contracted vessel, the marvels of hemostasis through coagulation mechanism must proceed through its sequence of events that finally bring out the formation of a blood clot. The reasons for control of hemorrhage are twofold in surgery. They are during the operative phase when you have to see what you're doing and that where extravasation of blood gets in your way, camouflages your field, you have to keep it out of the way. One does that by aspiration, by suction, but this tends to pull more blood away and tends to keep blood vessels open instead of having them closed. So we intermittently through our surgery try to keep bleeding under control through local hemostasis measures. These are chiefly applications of pressure. Now this pressure varies from the utilization of sponges. Ordinary gauze sponges are used for compression and we make uh, small rolls of these and insert them over areas where we hope to control bleeding. For example, if the tooth is missing after the extraction here in this typodont, we would place a gauze roll firmly and insert it uh, into this region, packing it in position, having the patient bite down on it. Whenever we leave a field in surgery, uh, we have a patient apply pressure uh, by biting down on sponges. The wounds in oral surgery are particularly uh, productive of hemostasis problem because the vascular bed, when you take out a tooth, uh, is complex. There's no wound quite like this one. The bleeding is coming from the bone where the vessels are torn open and the bleeding is coming from the soft tissues around the periphery. So you have really in the bone vessels that cannot adequately contract and the tearing of the soft tissue, you have a very complex wound and the normal physiologic measures of control of bleeding are really taxed by this wound. This is why many borderline bleeding tendencies uh, due to vascular abnormality or due to coagulation defect abnormalities are unmasked or are exposed when a tooth is taken out because of the complexity of that uh, disruption of blood vessels. Well, if there, there are a number of other measures that can be used for control of bleeding that are pressure applications, the hemostat is uh, named for its local role in controlling bleeding. Uh, it has a blunt nose. It, they are curved and straight. This happens to be a curved hemostat. Uh, it opens and is able to clamp on a vessel. If you have a vessel that's large enough, if a palatal flap is reflected and the major palatine is, artery is there, you can get a hold of it. If it has a severed end, and you can clamp that end off. Uh, that in itself will stop that soft tissue bleed. The small capillaries from most soft tissue wounds are usually too small. It is only arterial bleeding that generally can be uh, amenable to the use of a hemostat, uh, and you can then clamp that and then follow it with more pressure through the application of ligatures. Sutures can then be tied around the hemostat, 
or a suture can be passed, a needle pass, a so-called stick tie, to uh, establish that control of a major uh, arterial bleed. In the event that the bleeding is welling up from this socket, from down here where there's uh, a tear in a vascular abnormality, uh, that tends to keep coming up. There are a number of measures you can use to control that. The closed end of the hemostat can be penetrated down directly over the bleeding area and with pressure you can crush the adjacent bone matrix into the vessel opening and that will tend to control and stop it. If for some reason that is ineffective in controlling it, you can follow it up with other measures of obtunding or plugging the openings. Among those are a material called bone wax, which is uh, an absorbable uh, yet uh, uh, material that will mechanically give us the, uh, you can see it's packaged in this form. I've torn open the end of the package. We can take a small amount of it and this material is, tends to be soft. You can get just the quantity that you need and it can then be placed down into the area and pushed into the porous areas of bone and in that way plug those areas of porosity. That is bone wax. It can be left there. It generally is followed with pressure with a, a sponge for control. There are some situations where in the middle of a procedure you have a root tip that's broken off down there. There's a lot of bleeding around it and you can't see it and you'd like to slow up that bleeding. The suction is not enough and you want to control it. Well, you can pack a sponge down in there, a plain sponge, just by making a wick of the end of a sponge, stretching it out and twisting it in this manner and pick it up with the end of a cotton plier and pack it down firmly into the area and hold it there or have the patient hold it there by closing on that. Uh, or you can add the chemical actions of a topical vasopressor by using adrenaline. Uh, this is one to 1,000 adrenaline, unlike the material that you use in local anesthetic solutions. This, of course, is concentrated, and one must respect this concentration of adrenaline. It either comes in this ampule form or in a stock bottle uh, that uh, is brown and uh, because it does deteriorate with light. And if you take this material and again make the small wick and saturate the tip of this wick uh, in topical adrenaline and then pack this down after it's wrung out, pack that into the socket area, one will then get the effect of the direct vasoconstriction of a concentrated 1 to 1,000 adrenaline solution on that vasculature. And that can be quite helpful in shrinking the blood vessels, causing them to contract and allow uh, small thrombi to form in their ends to seal off the ruptured vessels. So that is a method that you can use during the time that you're operating. Now, when it comes to the end of a procedure, some of the usual forms of hemostasis are once again pressure, and as soon as you have the teeth out and the other trimming done in an area of extraction, begin right then to use pressure. And don't keep sucking out these areas, but again, put gauze in there and have the patient bite down. And as an assistant, use pressure uh, to clear the field of any blood rather than the sucker as you're closing. Now, in the closing process, of course, sutures in themselves afford pressure on torn soft tissues and this uh, very mechanical uh, measure of applying sutures to soft tissue margins tends to affect hemostasis. So one is careful about your application of sutures so that they firmly hold the tissue into position. There's a paradox about suturing in that if sutures are placed too tightly, they may tend to stretch the soft tissues so that the blood vessels are actually kept open. Generally speaking, all sutures tend to apply the right pressure and affect hemostasis. The, in the event that there still is some capillary ooze coming from a bone defect where teeth have been removed or pathology has been removed, 
there are other materials that are useful for additional topical hemostasis. These are uh, products that are absorbable. One of them is in the form of oxidized cellulose. Oxidized cellulose is absorbable. It comes either in this gauze form, which uh, we've opened up another one here to show you the texture of this material, either in this gauze form, and that can be rolled up into a tight roll again, placed into the socket with a cotton plier as a tampon and pressed down firmly into position. And that can often then be backed up with a sponge. Uh, it turns black, actually, in contact with serum and blood, uh, and it is absorbable. It's packed and left there. Oxidized cellulose is also put up in a form of a cone, a compressed material which expands considerably when it picks up blood, but these cones can also be inserted into defects and maintain, uh, be maintained there because they are absorbable. Another of the chemical adjuncts to uh, local hemostasis uh, can be gained in the use of other foam products. Uh, gelatin can be placed in a, in a foam uh, product. This is commercial gel foam. This material can be uh, compressed and used as a vehicle to carry other solutions, often topical thrombin can be uh, used in this manner and firmly placed down into a socket is another measure to control bleeding. Uh, the patient who returns to your office after an extraction with a bleeding problem, with prolonged bleeding, needs careful evaluation. Most of the bleeding problems that you will see are due to trauma. Either a blood vessel has been torn, bone has been fractured and sprung out to hold vessels open and keep them from contracting. These are the most common causes, are trauma. Uh, the second common cause is that of hypertension, the amount of pressure that's behind the patient's vascular system that keeps the pressure up and keeps the torn vessels open. This is another cause for prolonged bleeding. Uh, Infection can tend to either cause tissues to be inflamed originally and be dilated, therefore, or it can, infection, because of fibrinol lysins and other bacterial products, can tend to break down blood clots and cause secondary bleeding. Uh, these are some of the causes for the patient who returns with bleeding and which you will have to then evaluate. Last but not least among the aspects of bleeding are the true disorders, either of the vascular system or of the coagulation system. And as we said at the outset, it's the extraction wound that often will unmask and cause a trouble uh, to be diagnosed through that complication where the patient in soft tissue wounds has had enough uh, adequacy in their hemostatic mechanisms uh, to get along all right but you challenge them with an extraction wound and they have prolonged bleeding. When you see such a patient, you have to assess the amount of blood loss, make sure it's not excessive, make sure they're not going into shock, and then approach them. Most patients tend to be alarmed after bleeding from the mouth. They, this is all magnified in volume. And so they will uh, be quite anxious as well to reassure them. After you've taken their blood pressure and made sure they're not in shock, uh, then you can utilize uh, tranquilizing and sedating agents to calm them down a little bit. And if you have to go back, you put pressure over the site that's bleeding. If you have to go back in there, it's best to reanesthetize so you don't uh, cause them to additional pain as you're removing sutures and packing in materials. Uh, in the control of bleeding, we haven't mentioned thermal methods of hemostasis. Cautery can be used in operative surgery to uh, close off vessels by direct thermal electrical cautery. And also cold can be used in the form of packs. We often make up uh, packs, ice bags uh, of this order and have the patient hold them on the side of their face in order to control traumatic edema. And this also in effect induces some reflex vasoconstriction, cuts down the blood supply to the part that's bleeding and allows the normal 
hemostatic mechanisms enough time uh, to do their thing and to close off and establish the thrombi that are part of the initial phases of healing. Occasionally, around the mouth and jaws, there are real spurters. Areas of abnormal uh, vasculature, these are common in the mandible, in the nutrient canals in the symphysis area, and in areas in the posterior canal region. Bleeding from the nose may be encountered and can be a particularly difficult problem. Uh, in order to control that, we use either anterior nasal packs that are Vaseline packs, and this simply applies pressure again. These are in cans and are uh, in this manner uh, folded up and carried in in a uh, linear fashion, and the nose is packed one side at a time, and the mucosa that is lacerated is again compressed against the bony walls to control the bleeding. A post-nasal pack is required in some instances of gross trauma with fractures of the maxilla, uh, but it's rare that you'll encounter a need for that. Well, with this review, we've tried to demonstrate then some of the simple measures uh, of local control of bleeding uh, through certain adjuncts, most of them combinations of pressure and the use of tamponing materials of one sort or another in controlling uh, bleeding both during uh, surgery and uh, encountering a post-traumatic uh, or post-surgical bleeding episode. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.